I'm going to talk about the Mississippi Delta and Appalachia. And uh, one of the things that really interested me about the topic was the quote for the summer school that said, uh, Southern music sprang from the mud, the rivers, the forests, the fields, and the mountains. And uh, this whole time, we've kind of been talking about some special power that music has. You know, it does something to you. Music is special. It has a power. And uh, we're actually just starting to learn a little bit more about how that works. Uh, basically, we could take music, uh, different types of sounds, and we could play uh, music and look at water underneath a microscope, and we could see how different sounds are affecting those water molecules. And uh, you could look this up. People have played the sounds of Hitler giving a speech, or uh, the sounds of a rap song, or the sounds of a country song, and they've looked at molecules of water to see how they react differently. Um, so that's what I'm interested in, is not just what does southern music sound like, but how does it affect us on a, on a deeper level. Um, and we're learning a lot more about this. Um, and part of the reason is because we don't know everything there is to know about sound. Uh, for example, if you don't want to look at something, you can close your eyes. If you don't want to touch something, keep your hands to yourself. If you don't want to hear something, you're still going to hear it even if you plug your ears because sound is more pervasive. It goes right through you. It's a sensation, not just things that we hear. Um, and Aristotle actually wrote something about this in his work on the soul. He said that all bodies are capable of being affected by smells and sounds, but that some on being acted upon, having no boundaries of their own, disintegrate as in the instance of air, which becomes odorous, showing that some effect produced on it by what is odorous. So he's basically saying sounds and smells, they affect different bodies in different ways. Um, so I want to seek a different, better understanding of what's unique within the southern sound. And sound has a lot of power. We all know that whole decades have been defined by sound. Uh, 20s and 30s has a kind of big band sound and swing. Uh, 40s and 50s has doo-wop and soul, 60s and 70s has rock and disco, the 80s has synthesizers and dudes with makeup and long hair. Um, and I was, I'm a 90s kid. Somebody else said they were a 90s kid the other day. And this was my first connection to the South because one of the first big 90s bands, a 90s original sound, was uh, called a band named Nirvana. And they have a sound that's been called grunge. And uh, if you look into them, their lead singer, his name is Kurt Cobain, uh, at his last live performance, it was called MTV Unplugged, he actually mentioned that Lead Belly was one of his biggest influences and that somebody from the Lead Belly estate uh, tried to get him to pay $500,000 for Lead Belly's guitar. And um, the more you look into it, you see these type of connections are just everywhere with our music today, as we've been learning so far. Um, and I do have an argument that I want to go along with uh, the stuff I'll be talking about today. Um, and my argument is that Southern people, we're more oriented to learn through touch, oral communication, sound, and listening. Um, we're more in tune with sound. And we can look through history and find places where this was evident. Um, in Virginia, Kentucky, Missouri, and Arkansas, people used Viva Voce voting. And they voted with the sound of their voice. Um, drinking and socializing were ways that people networked and influenced elections. Uh, Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, even Lincoln and Illinois all came to political leadership in states that voted with the sound of their voice. On one occasion, George Washington ran for the Virginia House of Burgesses and he served a quart and a half of alcohol per voter. Um, and there's even a painting, some people have talked about George Caleb Bingham, he has a painting called The County Election where you see this exact same uh, thing going on. People are talking and drinking and being boisterous and they're saying proudly who they're voting for in front of everybody. Um, so this oral tradition is really strong in the South and we still go by oral tradition here 
at the Abbeville Institute recording these lectures and passing them on. And um, when you look into it, I think that the North is actually more oriented towards print and visual mediums. Um, in 1888, Massachusetts was the first state to enact secret ballot as the law. And this shows that, you know, we go more by our voice, other people go more by uh, sight and what they can see, and we go by feeling in our heart. Um, so, a lot of people, when they think about sounds of the South, uh, they think about things like the crack of the lash, or field haulers, or the deliverance banjo scene. But in reality, it's got a lot of beautiful sounds. And because, as Southerners, we always have to be defending our heritage, we don't really have time to stop and think about all the different unique sounds that make the South so special. Um, and everybody thinks we only like country music. If you go out of state to a northern state, you tell them you're from the South, they think that you love country music. Um, it's a bad stigma. Um, and one thing that has contributed to this is one of my favorite Southern historians uh, named Richard Weaver. And I love Richard Weaver, don't get me wrong. I have ideas, have consequences in my bag right now. I have the Southern tradition at bay at home on my, on my mantle. But if you read Ideas Have Consequences, he went on a diatribe uh, over jazz. And these are some of the things he said about jazz. He said that it was born in the dives in New Orleans and that it was the clearest of all signs of our age's deep-seated predilection for barbarism. Um, I'm just going to read a couple of quotes that he's actually said about jazz. He said that it was a triumph of grotesque, even hysterical emotion over propriety and reasonableness. He wondered that jazz sounds as if in a rage to divest itself of anything that suggests structure of conf or confinement. He says that jazz reflects a mood impatient for titillation and reflects the desire of the performer for fullest liberty to express himself as an egoist. He says that by dissolving forms, jazz has left man free to move without reference expressing dithrambically whatever surges up from below. It's a music not of dreams, certainly not of our metaphysical dream, but of drunkenness. He said that jazz shows how the soul of modern man craves orgiastic disorder. And finally, he said one can detect signs of suicidal impulse. One feels at times that the modern world is calling for madder music and stronger wine is craving some delirium which will take it completely away from reality. So uh, I think we all know he was probably being a little bit dramatic there. And I, I just asked Clyde about this, and I think a big part of this was that he was living in Chicago uh, when he wrote this. And this is a real city mentality way to look at certain things. For example, if anyone here is familiar with uh, Henry Ford, he literally went on the record and thought that uh, jazz was a Jewish conspiracy to destroy American families. And he actually invested a lot of money to promote uh, square dances, uh, country music, because he thought that that was wholesome family entertainment compared to jazz, which we should be honored that this you know, distinguished northerner had to pick between two southern forms of music to you know, direct America's future. That really says a lot about our music. Um, and I'm not saying everything Richard Weaver says is bad. I mean. There's certain types of jazz, like acid jazz, which are definitely not Southern. And uh, these types of music pride themselves on being confusing and spontaneous. Um, but he went on later in the, in the book to say that in jazz, we hear a variable which the musician pours his feeling and whimsy more freely than the romantic poets laid their bleeding hearts. So that, to me, sounds like uh, something to be proud of when we consider um, our musical heritage. Um, and kind of going off of how Weaver looked at music, uh, I like to look at another Southern artist named DeBose Hayward. Um, and he wrote that if you are too obsessed with forms and how everything is structured, it's only going to hold you back as an artist in the long run. Um, and he wrote a beautiful novel called Porgy during the Southern literary renaissance, and it went on to be adapted into an original American opera about Gullah people in Charleston. Um, and that's what he said, is that you need to unlearn everything you've been taught and just examine the world from your own senses. And that will give you true artistic ability. And that's what I want to do today, is I want to unlearn some of the things that we know about the Delta 
or the things we think we know about the Delta and Appalachia and look at them from a sensory perspective. So I'm going to try to tell this like a story and I'm going to play some songs at the end that we can listen to together. Um, so the first person I want to talk about is Charlie Patton. I passed out, every, uh, everybody should have a sheet of paper with a picture of Charlie Patton on there. Um, he was born around 1891 and he's the first person we're going to talk about because uh, he's a little bit before the second person we'll be going over. So I'm not a blues expert, okay, um, and I'm hoping as we continue we can all discuss more about this and learn more together. The origins of the blues are a little bit nebulous and there's a lot of different claims. Um, like Dr. Daniel would say, a lot of people think, you know, because of the Blues Brothers that it's from Chicago. Um, but it's undoubtedly born in the Delta. It wouldn't have happened without cotton. The Delta is an incredibly fertile land stretching from Memphis to Vicksburg, bordered on the west by the Mississippi and on the east by the Yazoo, and is now split by Highway 61. From there, the Blues migrated to Chicago, Texas, and the West Coast, where it took on different forms. There's an African contribution to the sound. On the Senegambian coast, there's a lot of string instruments, uh, like one-string gourd fiddles and two to four-stringed lutes that are just like guitars. And there were also contacts with Arab and Berber cultures that already had oral traditions. So these sounds also have an African origin. And as Africans came to America as slaves, their sounds began to meld with Christian white religious songs, British folk music, and different plantation chants. And the result became a deeply spiritual, unique sound that one historian has described as the mixing and hybridization that took place in the planting fields as African slaves and an immigrant indentured servants from the British Isles worked together. And a lot of people don't like to talk about the together aspect. We all know that. And people like to forget, especially in the Delta, the conditions that these folks lived and worked together. Listen to what Faulkner said about the Delta in 1908. This is how he described it. He said that the vast alluvial swamp of cypress and gum and brake and thickets lurked with bear and deer and panthers and snakes, out of which man was still hewing savagely and violently the rich, ragged fields in which cotton stalks grew ranker and taller than a man on a horse. Um, and today, even, there's still lots of wild turkey, wild cats, wolves, mosquitoes. And um, originally, after Reconstruction, by 1879, the Delta was being uh, valued as a source of white oak. There were millmen from the Midwest, and they had began depleting all the hardwoods in uh, Michigan and Wisconsin, so they were looking for new places to start lumber mills, and the Mississippi Delta was a prime place at first. Um, but it wasn't until the railroads came that it was possible to do large-scale farming and logging because of the mud. It was a real thick mud there. We've been talking again and again about mud. Um, listen to what one observer said at the turn of the century. He said, in the rainy season, the wagon roads are well-nigh impassable, and a long, high haul by wagon through the alluvial mud of this country is and will continue to be out of the question. The soil was so lush that it could yield one or two bales of cotton when, per acre when half a bale was considered a good yield. And the sediment was so fine that one could drill 50 or 60 feet beneath the topsoil before touching rocks. And out of this sweltering and swampy frontier came a plantation called Dockeries. Um, and this is the plantation and sawmill where Charlie Patton really developed his musical style. And this is also where the Confederate connections to the blues come in. So Dockery's plantation was owned by a man named William Dockery. He was the son of a Confederate colonel who was wounded at Corinth, and their family lost their fortune and got wiped out by the war. Um, Dockery graduated from Ole Miss in 1886, he worked for two years at his uncle's store in Memphis, and then he set out for the Delta to make a fortune. He found himself in a legitimate frontier where hundreds of cattle were still grazing along the cane ridges outside of town. This is a quote where he described the Delta. There was a small amount of cleared land then, and it was on the bayous, lakes, and rivers. 
The country was covered with blue cane, 15 to 20 feet high, and the land was rich as cream. I remember seeing one 40 acres of land being traded for a cow and another 40 acres being traded for a Winchester rifle. The only land on large plantations was on the Mississippi River front. Rosedale, Mississippi was the county seat and was hard to get as there were no roads worth considering. I remember going to Rosedale in a tall two-wheeled cart with a single horse by way of Marigold. My wheels got stuck and I had to pull the cart out into the cane and hang the harness in a tree and lead the horse for several miles. So again, we keep coming back to this mud, especially when we're talking about the Delta. So it's not even an exaggeration to say that this was a frontier, but by the time Charlie Patton was born in 1891, it was really starting to settle down and get developed. Dockery's plantation was nearly 10,000 acres. Um, it was both drained and cleared by Dockery himself, and he acquired the land for something around $5 an acre, and he lived to see it attain a value of $300 an acre, which made him a millionaire. But he was a simple guy. He didn't like to be called a planner. Uh, he thought a uh, merchant and farmer was the label that he would prefer. And he liked simple pleasures like fishing, hunting, and horseback riding. Uh, his plantation, listen to this, had a government post office, minted tokens and paper scrip, a commissary with six full-time employees, a sawmill and blacksmith, two churches, two elementary schools, and a physician on the property to take care of anybody black or white. And people also like to overlook the opportunities that were in the Delta. A day laborer was earning about $1.20 a day there in the 1920s, while most people in the hill country were making about 50 or 60 cents. A member of the Dockery family once stated that the total wages paid out by the plantation ran to some $20,000 annually in the 1920s, and that the average family could clear two to $3,000 in a season. So I looked into this because I thought that seemed like an interesting amount of money for that time. And if you plug this into an inflation calculator, I plugged in $2,500 in 1925, and that came out to $35,000 in today's money. So, I mean, that's not a very bad living. There were many black success stories there, and even all black towns, like one called Mound Bayou, and it was financed by a black man named Charles Banks, who many people called the J.P. Morgan of his race. There was a man on Dockery's named Lee Frederick, a black man, who amassed over $100,000 in 15 years by helping Dockery clear this land and working on this plantation. And we have to remember that not every black person that lived here was tilling the soil or sharecropping. Uh, a man named Alfred Stone wrote this in 1906. He said, quote, throughout the Delta, there are blacks filling places of responsibility and trust. In the country, the gin crews and engineers are practically all black, and there are black foremen, agents, and sub-managers. There are many constables, and there, is in a, and there is in my county a black justice of the peace. In my own town, every mail carrier is black, and we have a black on the police force. Some are employed by cotton factors and buyers and earn from $600 to $1,000 per annum. One cannot travel through this section without observing black landowners everywhere. And another aspect of this plantation life, especially in the Delta that we tend to forget, is the leisure time. There was about a four to five month layoff each year in between ginning and planting. There were even shorter layoffs between planting, chopping, and picking styles, cycles of cotton growing. During the busy season, most of the workers were not laboring continuously. One study shows that adverse weather and other factors produced a 15-day work month. Dockery's own son held that workers were employed fewer than 150 days a year. And because of the large amount of downtime, many black Mississippians took up a guitar uh, without any real hopes of making a career. They were just fooling around, just trying to learn some chords, um, just having fun. And there's two more reasons that uh, Delta plantations like Dockery's harbored the blues. There was kind of a laissez-faire attitude towards the activities of the tenants at this time. And many owners, like Dockery himself, took the route of absentee ownership as soon as they could afford it. Um, and W.J. Cash wrote about this in The Mind of the South. He talked a lot about how 
once you had plantation owners that were absentee and you know letting other people run things it, it really changed how the south was structured and and how things operated now most sources show charlie Patton was born here around here in 1891 and he was mixed race but his parents ethnicities are unknown uh i think it was dr clark said uh black and white and we think maybe cherokee or choctaw one of the two um, his complexion was light as a white person he had straight hair he walked with a limp he was described to be somewhat frail and short and he had a smile that had some missing back teeth his voice was reputed to be able to travel 500 yards because it was so loud um, and his voice you'll hear today when we listen it's been described as a growl and the words kind of bleed into one another at certain points and some of his words are not uh, totally distinguishable it was said that he never gambled or danced but he loved to drink and it often took him two hours of steady playing and drinking before he really hit his stride Patton was even claimed to prefer fatty meat on the assumption that it kept him from getting drunk and uh, we kind of do the same thing. I know a lot of people that like to go out for nights of drinking and then go to places like Waffle House because you get that fatty, greasy food in you. It keeps you going. Um, so Patton's family moved to Dockeries in 1897, and he began to pick up some blues technique from a man named Henry Sloan. And while Patton may have learned a few chords from him, he was largely self-taught and developed his own style that incorporated stomps, slapping the guitar box, which we'll hear today, and even playing the guitar between his legs and behind his head. So he was doing things that Jimi Hendrix did way before Jimi Hendrix. Um, he was a man of contradictions. He was known to dress like a simple plow hand, but he lived a flashy lifestyle. He normally had drivers. He would carry around bags of money. He had a kind of an entourage that would travel with him. Um, another blues man said, uh, named Hayes McMullen said that Charlie Patton would scrap in a minute. And he even stated that he once saw Charlie Patton smash a guitar over a woman's head. So I thought, uh, I wanted to let you know that so you don't read that and think, well, Martin talked about this guy that hit women with guitars. Um, so just wanted to get that out there. Um, and he also said that he never went one single night without witnessing a verbal clash between Charlie Patton and another person. And I'm going to get into why that was. But this type of talk was common at Delta Barrel Houses. And it was referred to as woofing. And this is what Zora Neale Hurston described woofing as. She said it's, quote, a sort of aimless talking. A man half seriously flirts with the girl, half seriously threatens to fight, or brags of his prowess and love, battle or financial matters and even though most reports show that charlie Patton died of a heart condition many of his acquaintances refuse to believe this and think that um, he could have been killed or maybe even poisoned um, and we'll get into a little bit more about this but you have to understand the environment that he was playing in and the environment where the blues was born these barrel houses they were sometimes called juke houses they were commercial recreational spots that had gambling, dancing, a bar with whiskey straight from the barrel. That's why they called it a barrel house. Um, there was a brothel, a boarding house. Um, and at the time, you could get a whole pint of whiskey for about 50 cents. And the barrel house had uh, food like hot fish, soda, beef stew. They would open on a Friday night and remain in continuous operation through Sunday um, with people staying all night. The Delta area was also more promiscuous than the hill country because um, people lived farther apart in the hill country and um, there were no real forms of entertainment out there. And one interesting thing that I like to point out is that the, these barrel houses had their own vernacular. They had their own language, kind of like if you read Shakespeare and Romeo and Juliet, the two families. One family will bite his thumb and kind of make up an insult at the other family they did things like this in the barrel houses. Like they would say, uh, for a woman that they didn't think was any good, they would say things like, you're just a crayfish. You come out, you get what you want, and then you doodle back into your hole. Or uh, a dead cat on the line was a way of saying that you had a problem from your past. Or saying, my stomach thinks that my throat's been cut. That's a slang way of saying that you were hungry. You thought you were going to die from hunger. Um, so these barrel houses had a lot going on. 
The activities resembled earlier plantation frolics, but they were open to the broad public, um, with some Delta clubs regularly attracting people from as far as Memphis. Um, and usually about 50 to 75 people would show up. And they were further distinguished by green exteriors, and they generated enormous gambling profits. One operator estimated that a prosperous barrel house could make approximately $1,000 on a Saturday night with upwards of $1,500 in an entire weekend. Most barrel houses were started with white investment and they had black managers, often were maintaining uh, payoffs with local sheriffs because there could be violent events that would happen that would threaten to shut down these barrel houses. And we'll get into some of these events. Um, but the violence could be a regular part of it. Um, they had doormen that would check weapons at the door um, and you had to wear church attire, which is kind of interesting. Um, so in this environment where there could be this arguing, this new vocabulary, this liquor, women, um, this is the type of environment Charlie Patton became renowned for his performance skills. And he got into many squabbles, particularly over women. Um, as I said, he liked to drink, so he would get liquored up. And at times he called other men's wives honey, sugar, things like that, because he was an overly confident person. Um, and at least twice in his career, he suffered disabling wounds. When he met another blues man named Booker Miller, Patton had a scar on the side of his forehead that looked like an imprint from a knife or a bottle. On one occasion, a man's wife got drunk and sat in Charlie Patton's lap. The, man's, uh, the woman's husband came over and jerked Charlie Patton's chair out from underneath him, and a fight ensued. Another time, a man's wife knocked Charlie's fish sandwich on the floor. She bumped into him, knocked his fish sandwich on the floor. He's sitting here expecting the woman to pay for his sandwich, uh, and her husband comes up and cusses him and shoves him onto the floor, so he got up and knocked the guy out. Um, at a barrel house called The Hole in the Wall, Patton suffered a near-fatal gunshot wound that might have accounted for his partial limp. Um, and these, this is just breaking the ice. Um, a blues man named Willie Morris saw another man attack Charlie Patton because his wife was glancing at him. Um, in 1933, Patton almost lost his life in Holly Ridge because a woman sat on his lap and in a rage her husband came over and slashed his throat. And you'll hear today when you hear his voice, it sounds very raspy, uh, something off about it, that's what it's from. Um, and this constant consumption of alcohol, the pursuit of women, um, it's led some to believe that he may have been killed by a poison dose of whiskey because he died at a very young age. Um, and these brutal encounters, I argue, show that Patton's uh, environment was just like the old plantation mindset that W.J. Cash talked about. Listen to this quote and tell me whether or not you think this describes uh, the blues environment later. He said, quote, the individualism of the plantation world would be one which, like the backcountry before it, would be far too much concerned with bald, immediate, unsupported assertion of the ego, which placed great stress on the inviolability of personal whim and which was full of the chip on the shoulder swagger and brag of a boy, one in brief of which the essence was the boast, voiced or not, on the part of every Southerner that he would knock the hell out of whoever dared to cross him. End quote. So Patton was a lover and a fighter, and these were concepts of honor that came from the plantation mindset. Um, and he seriously personified sex, drugs, and rock and roll before these things became major industries. He was doing it just for fun, to make pocket money and to get away from the plantation. Um, he has songs like Shake It and Break It, which we'll, we'll uh, listen to today. And it's a dance hit from 1930, which when you read about everything going on in 1929, you wouldn't think people would be writing big dance hits in 1930, but he did. He wrote a song called Spoonful Blues, which is interesting because um, I've read some sources that show Spoonful was a slang term for cocaine at the time, which I definitely did not get that impression from Dr. Clark yesterday. But um, the Memphis Commercial Appeal, which was a newspaper at the time, estimated that 80% of the city's black residents used, used the drug, and it was available for a nickel or a dime at pharmacies, and they would give you a small spoonful-sized amount. And that could just be an urban legend, 
Maybe some people need to research that more. But um, there were some sources that pointed that out. Um, and he has a lot of songs that are based on the land. He has one called High Water Everywhere, talking about the floods of the Mississippi and how devastating it was for people's land. He has a, another song that we'll listen to today called the Mississippi Bow Weevil Blues, which talks about the importance of land and how it could be destroyed by pests like the boll weevil. And one of the most interesting things about Patton and this blues style is that it was totally contradicted by his religious beliefs. He wasn't a strict fundamentalist, but he was raised in a fundamentalist environment. And he was taught that uh, blues and religious feelings, these were irreconcilable opposites. And he was said at certain times during his performances to break down into interludes of church music. Um, he has a lot of gospel songs. And during his downtime, he imagined himself an enemy of God that could burn in hell for playing sinful dance music. And like many great artists, his art could have, you know, could have tortured him. He could have been doing this for fun and thinking, wow, this is bad for my soul. Um, we don't really, we see the art, but you don't see the torture that people have to go through to make that art. Um, and one of the last interesting things I want to talk about with Patton was that he was a wanderer. He was a real hobo type person, not a legitimate hobo, but only in the fact that he liked to travel place to place. Um, he would get on a train track and he would travel to another town where country folks were pouring out their hearts in song while audiences ate fish and bread, chewed sugar cane and dipped snuff while waiting for trains to carry them to another town. And as a blues singer, he went wherever the wind was taking him. Um, anywhere he went, he was guaranteed whiskey, women, and food. Um, he got his start performing in the 1910s, and by the 20s, the hobo type was already being sung about a lot. Um, we've talked about Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? The opening song um, is a guy named Harry McClintock, and he's singing the song called Big Rock Candy Mountain, and that's a song about hobos looking for basically a hobo paradise. Um, and the same artist wrote another song called Hallelujah, I'm a Bum, which is a great song. I highly recommend listening to it if you haven't heard it. But the point is, after Charlie Patton had already broken out and done his thing, this lifestyle became really famous and people were singing about it. Uh, one author wrote that Charlie Patton was a great artist, not for his forcefulness in making blues dance music, but for his refusal to respect the abiding limitations and conventions of his genre. Again, he wasn't concerned about the form or the, you know, the chord structure. He was just going by feeling, going by his heart. And he was the only recorded blues musician of his day that brought uh, drama, surprise, spontaneity, and a lot of subtle variety in his work. Um, some other artists had gimmicks. Like we've listened to Robert Johnson a couple times. Um, and I talked to Dr. Clark about this. This is a myth, but a lot of people think that Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil to learn how to play the blues. And that's pretty much a myth, but that myth was used to help uh, bolster his reputation as a blues artist. Just like Lead Belly. I love Lead Belly, but the Lomaxes paraded him around in a prison outfit to get him more attention so he could sell records. And Charlie Patton didn't have to do these things. He literally just went to drinking, and people just followed him and listened to wherever he went. Now, uh, totally the opposite now. I want to go 600 miles away from Dockery's, and I want to go to Daisy, Kentucky, where Roscoe Holcomb was born in 1912. Now, his story is a lot different than Charlie Patton, but they have some connections to the land um, and through their history of being Southerners. Um, he noted that, Roscoe Holcomb noted that his people were from North Carolina and went back as far as the American Revolution, but they left because of trouble and changed their name when they moved to Kentucky. He was described by another author as being closer to the people of the third world rather than to European high art culture. Holcomb made his first banjo at home by taking a square box, tacking a piece of metal over it, putting a neck made out of poplar with strings, and he just started picking that and learned totally on his own. And he said that within the first 12 months, he learned 400 tunes. That's his words, that's not mine. He said he learned 400 tunes within 12 months, and that it came naturally to him. And I keep, anytime I talk to someone with musical ability, they just say, you know, I did it, I just did it. They didn't even know how. Um, so by the time he was discovered, 
1959, the musical traditions of East Kentucky had begun to fade. The region once had vibrant social activities involving music like bean stringings to preserve string beans, uh, box lunches, fiddle and banjo contests, molasses making, um, string bands entertaining at moonshiners stills, and barn dances. This is a quote from Roscoe Holcomb about this uh, kind of golden age of when he was younger. And this is his quote. I'm going to try to say it like he would have said it. I've played for square dances till the sweat drip off my elbows. I used to play for square dances a lot. Used a bunch of us get out. Maybe we go to a party somewhere, and after the party was over, the moon be a shining bright, you know, and we'd all just start back home and gang up in the road. Somebody'd start his old instrument, guitar or banjo or something or other, and just gang up in the middle of the road and have the awfulest square dance right out in the middle of the highway. People could have real good times back then. Nobody raised no trouble or anything, and it didn't matter how much you was out. People would trust their girls out with boys and neighbors. Nowadays, they won't do it. And I totally relate. I, I won't let my daughter walk out the front door without freaking out. Um, so that's, that's his quote on the, the golden era of you know, his younger days when his music was more culturally proliferant. Um, so he lived in isolation in these mountain towns uh, with these memories for years before anybody ever recorded him or before um, he had actually seen a real guitar. Um, he never saw a real guitar until his adult years. And he said he never felt like a musician and didn't think he could make a career out of it because it would put his family at risk. He was so used to coal mining, hard, back-breaking work that you know, taking a chance as a musician just didn't make sense to him. Um, he was the last of a generation whose music was home-based before radio and phonographs. He was content to just sit at home sing on his porch, and preserve his music rather than commercialize it. Um, these were humble people, and for most of the 1800s, Appalachian communities like Roscoe's followed a traditional uh, pattern of family farms on small plots in the valleys and uplands. Life was simple and quiet and dedicated mostly to agricultural work. Listen to what Tocqueville said about Kentucky. Quote, as the Kentuckian lives in an idle independence, his tastes are those of an idle man. And the energy which his neighbor devotes to gains turns with him to a passionate love of field sports and military exercises. He delights in violent bodily exertion. He is familiar with the use of arms and is accustomed from a very early age to expose his life in single combat. And I'm going to kind of get into why he thought the Kentuckians were so rugged and uh, violent. We'll, we'll get into that. But one thing I want to say is that this was kind of the Jeffersonian vision of America. These people got to live for a short time. And Roscoe even talked about this. He thought that his people were traditionally stronger because they were raised on pure food from the land. Um, there's a historian named R.D. Eller, and he wrote that by the third decade of the 20th century, the Jeffersonian dream in Appalachia had become a nightmare of exploitation, corruption, and social tragedy. While the southern mountains remained a predominantly rural area, changes in the land ownership, the economy, and the political system had left people dependent, impoverished, and powerless within a new alien social order." End quote. And after having lived through the transformation of his rural farm community, into an industrial economy, music became a way to preserve his culture that became consumed by this industry and lost uh, many of its subtleties and great aspects. Um, and the people weren't as, they weren't able to be self-reliant anymore because of how much the industries had rooted in his hometowns. Um, so work was Roscoe's life. He never had desire or the time to make records or have live performances for a long time until his later years. Um, in, middle age, in his middle age, his music lost much of his importance to kids in Appalachia who were busy listening to Elvis and Johnny Cash. So the traditional uh, music we'll listen to by him was a form that was going to get lost. And some artists have said that his music is a link between bluegrass and a more old-timey music that came before it. 
So I'm not an expert on bluegrass, and I know some people will have good talks about that. Um, and we keep talking about there is an older sound, an older religiousness in the South. And I think Roscoe is kind of the missing link that can help us look into that a little bit more. Roscoe was also a strict conservative um, to the point where he once was quoted as having said he didn't approve of long hair on any man except for Jesus because Jesus was for men and women. That's what he said. Um, and a major influence on this was his old Baptist upbringing, which forbade the playing of instruments. Um, Roscoe quit playing music early on because he thought it was wrong. They taught him it was wrong, and he's, this is what he said about this. He said, quote, I got to reading the Bible about it and asking David. You know, David was a man out of God's own heart, and he played music, set his tunes and danced in front of the Lord with all his might, trying to bring the spirit back. I said, well, as good a man as David was, there wasn't no wrong for him to play music, and it wouldn't be wrong for me. And so I just picked music up, and never, it never bothered me a bit. Um, and he was, that's end quote, he went on to join a Baptist sect called the Holy, Holiness Church, and they praised God with string instruments, and they played many old Baptist hymns. And when you listen to his music, you'll, you'll hear a very strong spiritual feeling. And when you, there's actually a couple documentaries about him. When you watch him in church, I mean, it's a, it's a one-room uh, shack. No, it's not even as big as this room. It's got old, ragged wallpaper, and they just play it. I mean, it is a revival-like experience. People on their knees shouting. It's a very deeply spiritual experience. It's not just playing music to them. Um, as far as how Roscoe looked, again, you have the picture, but his, um, he was described as having cracked hands um, from working with cement. He had craggy, weathered features that were set off by clear blue eyes. His body was heavily damaged, and he had a shambling gait from work-related injuries. Um, he once said that he worked construction most of his life. He worked in coal mines, worked in sawmills. He actually broke his back, and he wasn't able to work much after that because um, his body was just in pain. Um, and his singing is literally a struggle between his creative uh, talent and the limits of his lungs. And you'll hear he sings in a very high pitch, and it's because if he tried to sing low, it would hurt his already damaged lungs. Um, and Roscoe was a real stoic. Um, the pain from all the years working in the mines was evident in his voice. And some of the first people who recorded him described it as a music that came from a life of hard work in coal mines and lumber mills, from deep religious belief, from a past of banjos and square dances in the moonlight and moonshining in the mountains. And when we start looking into Roscoe, they call his specific uh, sound the high lonesome sound. Um, and when we start looking into his area where he's from, there's a lot of violent events that have taken place um, in regards to coal mining and unions. And I'm going to read about a few of these events that have happened. Um, the year Roscoe was born in 1912, there was a, a strike. It was called the Paint Creek Cabin Creek strike of West Virginia in 1912. This lasted over a year and resulted in the deaths of 50 people, um, and many more died after that from starvation and malnutrition. There was a battle in West Virginia called the Battle of Matawan in 1920, and miners went on strike to gain recognition for the United Mine Workers of America. On May 19th, the same year, 12 security agents uh, came and tried to evict the miners from their company houses, and when the guards left, they argued with the police chief, and there was some shots that went off, um, and it resulted in the deaths of two coal miners, seven agents, and the mayor of the town. Um, the largest up uprising in the United States history, labor uprising in the United States history, is called the Battle of Blair Mountain. This is the largest, best organized, and most well-armed uprising since the Civil War. For five days from late August to early September 1921, in Logan County, West Virginia, some 10,000 armed coal miners confronted 3,000 lawmen and strike breakers, called the Logan Defenders, who were backed by coal mine operators during the miners' attempt to unionize. Uh, the battle ended after approximately one million rounds were fired and the U.S. Army intervened by presidential order under Warren G. Harding. 
And then just 40 miles away from where Roscoe's home was in Harlan County, there was a Harlan County War. And this happened in the 1920s. Um, and this is something somebody needs to look up. I, I found some sources that were saying in the 1920s, the homicide rate of Harlan County, Kentucky was higher than any other county in the United States. Um, and it says it was seven times higher than Al Capone, Chicago. So I think we really need to research what, what happened there and why the homicide rate was so high. But in the first two decades, the county's population had increased over sixfold. So many people coming in for the new coal mining opportunities. Um, it increased from 10,000 to 64,000. The family structure began to break down. There were high rates of divorce. Um, one in four marriages in Harlan County in this time uh, resulted in failure and a growth in child desertion. People were just leaving their children. They couldn't afford to, to take care of their children. And after a 10% pay cut in the depths of the Great Depression, workers organized with unions and began striking. This started in 1931 and lasted until about 1939. Mine guards protected the few who were allowed to work, and gunfire was exchanged between strikers and guards uh, early on. There were ambushes, skirmishes, and listen to what the governor said. Uh, this is his quote about the terror in Harlan County. Quote, There exists a virtual reign of terror in Harlan County, financed in general by a group of coal mine operators in collusion with certain public officials. The victims of this reign of terror are the coal miners and their families. A monster-like reign of oppression whose tentacles reached into the very foundations of of the so social structure, and even into the church of God. The homes of union miners and organizers were dynamited and fired into. It appears that the principal cause of existing conditions is the desire of the mine owners to amass for themselves fortunes through the oppression of their laborers, which they do through the sheriff's office. So, there's a lot of collusion, a lot of uh, fighting over these mines. People could not even... Uh, make enough to live, and it's a violent place. And so I think all these things, which were happening in Roscoe's lifetime, um, really contributed to his sound. Um, it's, it's a combination of pain as well as emotion from living in this type of environment. Um, music was a celebration for his people, a way to ease the pain in their lives. Coal mining was already dangerous in the 20th century, but the rise of unions and communism brought a new level of violence and despair never before seen in the region. Between 1908 and 1935, at least 50,000 miners died extracting coal. And this is somewhat um, of an urban legend. I, I need someone to verify this, but there's an urban legend that the word redneck began as a word to describe pro-union miners who often wore red bandanas as a sign of protest. And my biggest piece of evidence for this is a socialist novel from 1936, and the name of the novel is called Redneck by a guy named McAllister Coleman, and he uses the word in the book twice. On one occasion, the main character, who is a charismatic union leader named Dave Houston, he admits that, I'm not much to be proud of, I'm just a redneck miner. And then later on in the book, a local police captain curses Houston as a GD redneck during an interrogation where he beats him with a sawn off chair leg. Um, so someone might know a different origin for the word redneck, but that's one that I kept coming across when I looked into this. Um, so with this violent world, it's really a miracle that we still have um, Holcomb sounds recorded. And there's a great article on the Abbeville Institute by someone named Michael Armstrong about the invention of the Appalachian hillbilly. And it shows how sociologists came into this area in the region um, the same time as the Harlan County War and they warped this hillbilly stereotype to purge locals from the area. Um, and they made these mountain people look backwards when the real barbaric people were the, the, minor, uh, the unions and these mining industries. Um, so by Roscoe's later years, he admitted he had enough of this labor and that the old mountains were wore out. He tried to make a decent living recording some songs, uh, playing at festivals and traveling, but uh, his, his weak physical condition caught up with him. Um, he has three albums recorded in his lifetime, and there's two documentaries. 
Um, so I kind of want to wrap this up and just talk about some connections, and then I'll play a few clips. Um, both of these guys, Charlie Patton and Roscoe Holcomb, uh, defined their genres when they lived. Um, and you don't have to take my word on this. They were discovered by Northerners and recorded mostly in the North. All of Charlie Patton's albums were recorded in Wisconsin, Indiana, and New York. Um, he was recommended by a man from Mississippi, but most of his advertisements were done in places like Chicago. And they would, they would put out ads and they would say, uh, The Masked Marvel, see if you can guess who plays this, this album. And if you could write in, hey, Charlie Patton, uh, they would send you a free album. Um, and this is what the Chicago Defenders said about Patton. They said he was one of the best known guitar singers and guitar players in the South. What he can't do with a guitar ain't worth mentioning. That's what Chicago Defenders said. And while he was paid well, he was paid per song and didn't receive any money for record sales. So Dr. Daniel talked about the, how they were called race records at this time. And they tried to take advantage and get as many recordings in one session as possible. Um, Roscoe Holcomb, his records were recorded by Folkways, which was based in New York City and later sold to the Smithsonian Institute. The man who claims to have discovered Holcomb, uh, his name is John Cohen, and um, he states he went to Kentucky looking for old music and to study depression songs. He described Roscoe's sound as a man confronting his own existence, something that I think Dr. Harrelson talked about a lot. Um, Cohen was half artist, half scholar, and amateur folklorist. And while he did care about Hol Holcomb, he admitted that the people that were listening to his music were, were real hipsters that were just out of touch with the hard lives these Kentuckians were living. Um, and while it's great we have these recordings, it's a shame that these men were capitalized on by industry and they both died alone. They were both Southerners and they were poor men in a rich land. Their musical genius was exploited by industry, and it's a type of cultural imperialism. Um, they came from regions that were blessed with natural resources, and they developed sounds that were unique to their place. They lived through depressions, feared God, and they sang about older times. Uh, these industries took their music, and they might have commercialized it into American music, but we should always remember um, that these guys were from the South and that their sounds were inspired by the South. Um, so I'm just going to play a few songs, and if you have the songbook, uh, the songs that I'm playing are in the very back where the sheet music starts. Um, and I'm going to start off with Charlie Patton because he was before Roscoe Holcomb, and I think we should start chronologically. Uh, so the first song I want to play is the Mississippi Bow Weevil Blues. And if you know about the Bow Weevil, it migrated into the American South in the 1890s. It devastated entire fields of cotton crop and had a huge impact on the region. Insects lay their eggs inside of a budding cotton plant, cotton plant um, where the larvae consume and destroy the plant. Um, and there's actually, interestingly, a piece of trivia, the town of Enterprise, Alabama, has a monument to honor the boll weevil because it forced them to adapt to mixed farming and manufacturing instead of agriculture alone. So that'll be the next monument that they attack, is a boll weevil monument. Mark, mark my words. Okay, so this is called the Mississippi Bow Weevil Blue. He calls it Bow Weevil, but it's Bow Weevil is the correct way to pronounce it. There's a little bow weevil keeping moving in my head. You can plant your cotton and you won't get a half a fail on it. Mississippi's gonna get a little down 
mademoiselle pour moi, mais il y a du frère I'm just gonna play clips, um, but uh, you see he's kind of giving you a geography lesson here on where the boll weevil traveled, um, <laughs> how much destruction it did, so that's it's a really great song. Um, the next I want to listen to is called Screaming and Holler in the Blues. And these will just be clips, um, but notice in this one how he uses the guitar box and he slaps it to add some percussion to the song. And he also talks a lot about time going by and loving his mom and things like that. Já já no ai o mamão Na de dia de visão Já já no ai o mamão Na de dia de visão Já no ai o mamão Na de dia de visão the percussion comes in. Don't you know it'll break a heart, no? I live in this own way. So I just wanted to point out, um, he's talking about waking up with jinx all around your bed. And if you skip down in the lyrics, he talks about, Lord have mercy on my wicked soul. Um, again, going back to these guys were raised in fundamental backgrounds, fundamentalist backgrounds, sorry. Um, now this is one of his biggest hits. It's called Shake It and Break It. And this is a dance hit. And um, it's very upbeat. And I'm going to play a little bit more just because I want you to hear how he increases the speed as he goes along in this song. Time is winding down. I wanted to skip to Roscoe Holcomb real quick, um, and that's a that's a dance hit. And um, like I said, they use their own vocabulary. Jelly roll was definitely a vocab term for your woman, if you didn't know that. Um, so I'm going to go to Roscoe Holcomb now, um, and just real briefly, I wanted to listen to a man of constant sorrow because Oh Brother Where Art Thou has come up a few times, um, and it the origin of the song is nothing like the movie. It's serious misdirection misinformation that they're giving us. Um, so listen to Roscoe sing this real quick. Say, yeah, my man of conscience sorrow so I have seen trouble all my days so I bid farewell to 
Kentucky It's a place where I was born and raised So I'm going to stop it there because if you saw a brother where art thou, it's like a big band like where he was born and raised. It's like real happy and upbeat and they're dancing, the Soggy Bottom Boys, and it's nothing like that. It was written originally by another man in Kentucky around the 1910s, um, and it's clearly a sad song. It's not meant to be a happy, upbeat dance song. Um, and this next one is just instrumental. I just wanted to give you an idea of his banjo playing. It's called Coal Creek. That's why there's no lyrics. that one because it's called Coal Creek and the sound really feels like it's taking you around like you're going down a creek like it's telling you a story um, and this last one is called Little Birdie and I picked this one because uh, I don't know much about bluegrass but I hear this one and it's, I just want to slap my knee and seriously just break down in a dance when I hear this because he really gets into it and I think you'll like it. When he was talking before about you know people getting in the street and playing banjo and nobody had any worries and everything was safe this is the type of music they were playing um, but again I just wanted to say that uh, both of these guys Charlie Patton and Roscoe Holcomb they were connected through the land and that's what their sound came from I really appreciate your time yeah.